Greetings, Irish fans. All of us at Fighting Irish Media hope you and your family are healthy and safe. Right now, we'd like to run it back to October 21st, 1995, the day 17th-ranked Notre Dame hosted 5th-ranked USC at Notre Dame Stadium. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed the previous day at 4,794.86 points, an increase of 961 and a half points from where the market had opened on January 2nd. Bill Clinton was wrapping up his third year as president. The top-ranked song on the Billboard 100 chart was Mariah Carey's Fantasy. The 1995 World Series would open this night in Atlanta, with the Braves hosting the Cleveland Indians. But Irish fans were most concerned with their team's annual showdown with USC. Coming off a disappointing 6-5-1 record in 1994, the Irish lost their season-opening game to a Rose Bowl-bound Northwestern team, 17-15. After bouncing back the next week against Purdue, head coach Lou Holtz headed to the Mayo Clinic for spinal surgery and would miss the first game of his coaching career the following week against Vanderbilt. With defensive coordinator Bob Davey filling in for Lou, the Irish responded with their best performance of the season, a 41-0 win over the Commodores. Coach Holtz returned the next week and coaching mostly from the press box helped guide the Irish to four wins in five games, two over ranked opponents, the only loss on the road at seventh ranked Ohio State. By the time the Trojans came to town on October 21st, everyone knew the fate of the 1995 Irish season rested on the outcome of the USC game. The Trojans were 6-0, averaging 34 points per game while giving up less than 10 points per contest. John Robinson's squad was ranked fifth in the country and had legitimate thoughts of winning the national championship. It was the perfect setup for another classic Notre Dame USC showdown. This is our first episode of what we're calling Run It Back. We're going to go and relive some of the best moments in all of Notre Dame athletics. So when I was starting this, and I'll be honest, I'm not a Notre Dame grad, didn't grow up a Notre Dame fan. I am actually uh, the son of two parents who are class of 76 at USC. So full disclosure that... <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I come from a pair of Trojans. Um, but... You know, when this game was pointed out to me, it wasn't one that I've heard of a ton just walking around the halls in my four years at Notre Dame. But the more I talk to people, this is a game that I think impacts people a ton just because of the rivalry with USC. Um, it's the 1995 game we're going to go look back at. Jack Nolan's with me, of course, works for Fighting Irish Media now. He was working for WNDU at the time and Ron Paulus, who was the quarterback. So we've got a great combination of people to look back at this game. Before we get to the game itself, though, and I want to start with you, Ron. I mean, I was talking to people about how you came onto the scene at Notre Dame, and you were really one of the first super high-profile quarterback recruits coming to Notre Dame. And when I went and read some articles, this was a, an impact win for you, and it was kind of the culmination of a lot of hard work. But I want you to try to take me to before you got to Notre Dame and as you came to Notre Dame, what it was like to be such a high-profile recruit and what it's like to be that age becoming the Notre Dame quarterback. I, 
enjoyed a magical experience um, as a high school quarterback, as a young guy growing up in a football town in, in Berwick, Pennsylvania, small town USA, blue collar, hard work, Friday night lights. I mean, you, you, you put it all and wrap it all into one. Um, and that's the, that's the environment I came from. Um, it was a, it was a, a, a special experience at a, at a, at a really good football high school. Our coach, was one of the best in the country. Our program was one of the best in the country and produced a lot of, uh, a lot of great athletes through the year. So I was, you know, growing up, we, we dreamed to be Berwick Bulldogs. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't worry about the Philadelphia Eagles. We didn't worry about, you know, the Penn State Nittany Lions down the road. I mean, we, we dreamed to play for our high school and that's, that's the way we viewed it. And so for me growing up in, in my small town of Berwick and to have the opportunity to uh, become the starting quarterback, to win 15 games, to, to win and be ranked number one in the nation and win a state championship. And uh, it was really a, a magical experience brought me to the opportunity um, to play college football and, um, you know, a lot of opportunity out there at a number of different programs and had the great fortune to, to travel around and see a bunch of different places, you know, through my junior year and official visits that came after the season back then. Um, so we, there were no, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, committing early and things like that. We got done with the season, went on visits in January and, and tried to make the best decision possible. Uh, I had a lot of great options. Um, you know, there was nothing wrong with any of the schools that I narrowed it down to. Notre Dame felt most right to me. Notre Dame was, when I saw Notre Dame's campus, it's what I imagined a college campus should look like. Um, I was impressed and intrigued by the academics. Uh, Notre Dame was winning a ton of games. Um, you know, Rick Meyer was, was finishing his career here as a quarterback, uh, running and throwing the ball and, and leading teams. Um, you know, Coach Holtz was a, had the program at its peak. Uh, so it was really a, 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 a great decision, a fun decision. A, a, I'm, I'm thrilled with the decision I made to come to Notre Dame. I couldn't imagine having gone somewhere else. I couldn't imagine uh, having played somewhere else. But, you know, for that, in that time in my life, it was, um, you know, it was, it was a great time in my life. And I was thrilled to have the chance to uh, represent the university um, on, on national TV as, as the quarterback. So, and Tony, so Jack, you yeah. got to tell me, because you were covering the team, just how big of a deal was it when Ron was coming to Notre Dame? It was huge. And I'd be interested to know if Ron knows how big it was. And, and back then, you didn't have social media like you do today. People covered recruiting intensely, but not like today. But this was enormous. I know Ron has heard uh, to the point where he doesn't want to hear it anymore. Bino Cook, of course, said he was going to win three Heisman trophies. But this is how big it was. January 30th. I was doing Notre Dame basketball on the radio. We're in Poly Pavilion. Notre Dame's taking on UCLA the next day. Uh, this is 1994. And the game's on ABC. We're practicing and coming down the tunnel is Dick Vitale, huge Notre Dame fan. We got Paulus, baby! He's coming to <laughs> Notre Dame! I mean, even national commentators were just so excited if they rooted for Notre Dame. But, I mean, it was as highly covered – a recruiting process as any player that I'm aware of up to that date. And I'm wondering, A, Ron, did you realize that? And B, how did you deal with that? Because, it, you know, in some ways, I often wonder if Bino Cook was actually trying to elevate you or if he was trying to put more pressure on you. Because I've had a lot of conversations with Bino. And uh, Bino would like to needle Notre Dame at times as well. How did you deal with that hype? Well, I knew, sure, I knew to some extent um, how big things were, uh, you know, in, in my own world. Um, you know, this is, this is really pre-major internet recruiting, so everything was paper and magazines and things like that. And, yeah, coming off of my senior year, I, you know, off of my senior football season, I, I, I was on tour. You know, I was at the Atlanta Touchdown Club and the Tampa Bay Touchdown Club and the March of Dimes event in Detroit and, you know, traveling around the country and, and going on official visits. And yes, so I knew, um, you know, I knew that people were following what I was doing. Um, but I got to tell you, I, I, I mean, I have great parents and they really, really kept the process uh, kept me grounded in the process. My high school coach was really grounded in the process. And, 
you know, I didn't, I, I didn't talk to schools. I didn't deal with it at all during my football season. So I really turned the phones off and didn't take many calls until the season was over. So, you know, y yes, I knew there was a lot of attention being paid to me based on, you know, invitations to different events, but, um, you know, I was just, I was just a guy living in my world and, and, um, you know, excited to make a good decision and move on to college. So as I was watching this game back last night, I know Jack watched as well. Ron, you said you watched some of the highlights. You played in it, so you've got a firsthand experience. As a viewer, I was just struck at a couple things. First of all, football looks so different 25 years <laughs> later. I mean, I, I was probably seven or eight years old at the time, and I remember watching that kind of football, but it's really a stark contrast when you watch the play calling, <laughs> the outfits. Um, I mean, it's, it's totally – the sport has totally changed. And then from a broadcast standpoint, it's been revolutionized as well. You're with the football program right now. When you think back to this time and now you work closely with the program and you see the games every day now, what are the biggest and starkest changes you saw as you think back to 95? Well, yeah, the game has definitely changed. I mean, it was a, it was a slower paced game. It, we were in the huddle. We relied on, um, uh, you know, being very deliberate in what we were doing and, um, you know, physically overpowering the opponent. Um, after watching some of these highlights, I, I texted some of my friends that were on the O-line. I said, God bless you guys and Mark Edwards, you know, <laughs> because, you know, that was, we, we, it wasn't easy what we did, you know, to line up and, and run square into the defense and, and, um, and have success doing it. Um, it was just different than, than the way it is now. You know, those days it was long, time-consuming drives, 14-play drives with very, very little margin for error. You know, you, you gain three or four yards, four or five yards, third down. You know, what, what struck me in looking at the stats, we were 15 for 20 in third down conversions. Yeah. I mean, Ooh. that's unheard of yeah. to have that many conversions and that many third downs. Um, so the game, yeah, the game is definitely different. Uh, it's much faster now. There's a lot of different ways to move the ball down the field. And there were teams doing some of those things back then. It's just not the way we operated. It wasn't, it wasn't the, the offense that, that we ran. Um, you know, but, but yeah, the, the game is different. I mean, it was, a, it was a tough, it was a tough guy's game back then. Uh, while I think the athletes today are bigger, stronger, faster, um, it was tough as nails back then. There, there was no hiding from the collisions of, of the game back in those days. 95, you're a junior, but you're really just a sophomore. And I know I read a quote after this USC game where you felt this was really the first time that you thought you had played an integral role in one of those history-making victories for Notre Dame. What did this game do for you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my, my first year starting was 1994, um, you know, through injuries and ups and downs and things that happen uh, in the college football season. We didn't end up with a great record that year, um, you know, and that was a challenge. Uh, you know, we had we won games and and we're in some really incredible games that year. Unfortunately, we didn't we didn't win as many as we wanted. So 95 was our was our, our first year or my first year with a with a, a, a full complement of our team. And, you know, I had a year playing under my belt and the guys in my class had been playing for one and two years. And, you know, we felt like uh, we had guys, uh, senior leaders on that team. We, we felt really good going into the season and really had a, you know, a, a couple bumps along the way, but really had a really good season going. And this was an opportunity to play in one of the, the classic, college football rivalries, right? Notre Dame versus USC uh, at Notre Dame, two ranked teams. They're coming in undefeated. Um, all the, the, the glitz and glam and flashy guys from California coming to our cold environment here, the blue collar tough guy environment at Notre Dame. And, you know, so to, this was the ultimate clash uh, between styles, um, West Coast to the Midwest, styles of play, styles of recruits, where you came from in your background, what it looked like. Um, so this was, this was the first time in, in, in my career, this was probably my, um, I don't know, 15th or 18th or 17th game playing for, for Notre Dame. And it was the first time that I got to play in this game that had so much magnitude uh, between two ranked teams on this kind of setting. And, and so, yeah, it, it meant a lot to my career and um, personally and on, on my ability to help Notre Dame win a game that was really, really important. 
And Randy Cross said in the broadcast that he believed that you carried the weight of the Notre Dame offense on your shoulders. Well, there it sure was a lot of, felt like it. <laughs> that's what I want. Because, I mean, there was a lot of pressure, and that's what people will go to the beginning of the season. You lost to a very good Northwestern team, but nobody knew how good they were supposed to be. You, in fact, had embarrassed them the year before at Soldier Field in your debut, tying the Notre Dame record with four touchdown passes for, in terms of eligibility, a freshman. And, I mean, just the mood I remember at South Bend. People were just crushed. I know the bubble of the team, you can't feel that to the degree, but you had to prove yourself. And you did. You came back. You played very well. I mean, a huge victory. The Texas game was special as well. Uh, and you crush Texas, you lose on the road at Ohio State, which people kind of expected. Then you win on the road against the ranked Washington team. You had just eked out a victory on the road against Army, which got the doubters back in there. And I remember all the hype for this game. Your whole season basically rode on what happened in the USC game. You're a smart guy. You kind of knew that. But how did you deal with that because what I saw was not a guy that had the weight of the world on his shoulders. I mean, there were a couple of plays in the game where you guys were penalized and you were right in the official's face. I don't know if you can get away with that. Thing. You could actually hear you on the game cameras going, what do you mean? What do you mean? That's not right. I mean, with Lou up in the booth, you were probably the loudest offensive voice on that field in that game. Well, yeah. You, I mean, you took us through the season there and, and, and that's right. We lost the game to start the season to Northwestern. And, and while it was crushing to the, um, to the, to the greater Notre Dame nation, it, it was crushing inside the bubble as well. I mean, that was, a, that was a, a crushing blow to our season, our egos, our confidence. Um, little did we know they would go on and play in the Rose Bowl, and it, it turned out to be a really, really good team. Um, but it was, still was a game that we shouldn't have lost in our, in our minds. And, you know, and then you play a tough run. I, I mean, gosh, we're playing Texas and Ohio State and Washington three weeks in a row. With, it's a crazy with schedule. Army. Yeah, with Army and then USC. I mean, it's a really, really difficult schedule. And, um, you know, we, we were a tight knit group. We were battlers. We were ready to, to fight. We knew what we had to do going into the season. Um, and we got ourselves to a point, uh, against USC that we knew, you know, we knew too, we knew that we, you know, with a, with a third loss, um, on the season, it certainly, um, you know, jettisons a lot of the, the, the high hopes you have for the season, but to beat USC, uh, the higher ranked team, the undefeated team, um, at Notre Dame would do a lot for us. So, yeah, we knew it. And, and as far as me personally, um, I took great ownership for what we were doing. You know, I, I know Coach Holtz did and, and the rest of the coaches did as well. But as the player on the field and understanding my role as the quarterback and the leader, and um, yeah, I, I took a lot of ownership for it. And yeah, interactions with the officials and, you know, things like that. I, I you know, you play a bunch of games, you get to learn those guys and, and, you know, some you can have more conversations with and, and some you can't. I learned both of those lessons as well. But, uh, you know, it was it, it meant a lot to all of us. And, and I was happy to, to try to take ownership for, for pushing us towards victory, for sure. How much do you remember from that? You know, I remember the highlights, you know, I mean, I, I, I watched, I skimmed through the game too. And it kind of reminded me of some things. Obviously I remember, you know, a lot of the things that happened on offense, of course, uh, for the most part, the bigger plays or the touchdowns by Mark and, you know, the, um, you know, the hit by Ken and Tatum and, you know, in the, in the cold weather. I mean, there's certain things I just, I remember, but, um, you know, seeing the game, yeah, it did, it did make me, it, it did draw me onto some things that I hadn't, that I hadn't thought about. I, I knew at some point coach was in the booth with his neck injury. I didn't remember if that game was one of those games or not, um, which really, you know, altered the communication style, the way we all communicated, where I could come to the sideline and talk to him. That never, that didn't happen anymore. <laughs> um, you know, so getting plays from him to the sideline to, to the field um, caused some challenges. Anyway, just little, those kind of things. I didn't, I didn't recall um, some of those kind of pieces. So before we get into kind of the run of the game, I do want to talk about two storylines. You guys done a great job of, of setting up what the environment was like at Notre Dame. When I went back and watched this, and the, the one guy that popped off the screen, and I shouldn't have been surprised because everyone prepared me for it, but it was Keyshawn. You know, Keyshawn Johnson, six foot four, 210 pounds, where he's the best, I think, 
is short passes. Down the field, he's a huge threat, obviously, with his speed and his size. But he has the ability, much like a Jerry Rice or a Michael Irvin in the pros, to catch a five to six yarder and take it the other 50 to 60 yards. I mean, Keyshawn was a huge deal at USC. Uh, Sports Illustrated cover. I looked at his numbers coming in. He had 52 catches, 725 yards. And there was just something about this guy. You can see it 25 years later. He was different on the field. Ron, you, were, you obviously had a, a up close and personal view, but seeing him up close, the touchdown he had, I mean, that guy at that time was special. Yeah, he was, Keyshawn Johnson was a special player. I mean, looking back in the, in the all-time greats, he was a special college football player. I mean, he was, um, um, you know, had a, had a terrific season going, had a terrific career going, uh, a big guy. I mean, a big, physical, big, tall, uh, big body guy. Um, we had a really, really good cornerback in, in Alan Rossum who had a wonderful career. I mean, that was a big time size differential there. Alan could run anywhere he wanted to run. Alan could run with him, but Keisha was so big. And um, he nine talked a lot. Nine inches taller, Ron. Nine yeah. inches <laughs> taller. That's ridiculous. ridiculous. I mean, uh, Keisha was yeah. six four. What was Alan? Five seven? I don't know. But... I think he was five seven. I mean, that's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, just the challenge of dealing with um, Keyshawn, you know, with, with good quarterbacks throwing him the ball and a, and a threatening running game and a, and a really good offensive line and a tight end. I think their tight end was, a, was an outstanding player as well and another complimentary receiver. So Keyshawn, you know, he talked a lot. Uh, he was definitely a talker. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, uh, Keyshawn didn't mince words at all. And, and um, you know, we had our own, our own big-time receiver in Derek Mays, but Keyshawn certainly – was the uh, skill guy that, that got all the attention going into that game. The other thing I was curious about that you'd alluded to earlier, and they were all over it on the broadcast when I watched it back, was Lou being up in the booth. And he said it made him more creative as a play caller. Just And Charlie, you know what? I talked to Lou Holtz before the game, and he said he's going up in the press box because of chance of injury on the sideline. But he also said, you know, when I'm up there, I have a better view of things, and I tend to be more creative in my play calling. And that's what you've seen from the Irish. I don't remember seeing a screen to the tight end or a draw this early in a game. So they may be more creative on offense because Lou is up there. Inform me, someone that never played quarterback, especially at Notre Dame, what differences that was like that year with having him up in the booth and how that affected getting the plays in and whatnot. And then also if you did agree that, hey, we were kind of a little bit different offensively when we were calling plays from up in the booth. Yeah, I think, you know, when – when, when Coach Holtz was in the, in the booth, and, and I've done it as a coach, and um, you, you see the game differently. You just, you just see it differently. You're, out, you're, you're seeing it from above. It's almost like watching game film, and you can see things happening, and you see subtle movements and, and things you might be able to pick on on a defense that, uh, that you don't typically see from field level. Um, you know, and, yeah, we did get a little more creative with probably with more of, of the timing of some of our calls. Um, you know, I'm, I, I don't recall that we necessarily changed our offense or anything like that going into the game. Um, you know, we ran the same kind of running plays we ran and we were in the same kind of passing plays we were in. But where he got probably a little more creative was um, the timing of some of the calls where we'd have a run play, a run play, a run play. And he would see something happening and be able to call a pass play that would complement that run. And um, so that's, I think, where the creativity came in. The challenge of it was, you know, of course, is the communication. Back in those days, a lot of times we ran plays in and out from the sidelines, minimal signaling there, you know, there was no wristbands to look at plays. So a lot of it was, you know, getting a play call from Coach Holtz to the coaches, to a player who would run it out to me, and then I would give it to the, the team. So um, there, there was challenge to it, but I think it went, it went both ways. And, and you know, we, we did. We threw the ball 29 times in the game looking at the stats. And, you know, gosh, we threw the ball 29 times for 190 yards. We rushed 56 times for 190 yards. <laughs> You know, geez, sounds like we should have thrown the ball a little bit more, maybe. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> of course, spoken but, like uh, a true quarterback. <laughs> but uh, it was a really balanced attack with good creativity on the right timing of, of when we were calling the plays and when coach was, was giving us the plays. So, uh, yeah, it was a great output from the, uh, from the offense. With Lou in the booth, um, they, they showed a close-up. I think it was an illegal substitution. The play came in too late and you got flagged and, and you came over and expressed to offensive coordinator Dave Roberts clearly that you were upset 
would you have been able to express your mood the same way if that had been Lou on the sidelines? No. <laughs> so how was it? No, different you know, for yeah, you? no. I, I mean, look, listen. There's there's frustrations that go with the games, and and yes, we you know it was part of the um, challenge of the mode we were in, right? I mean, a, a late substitution, a late play call, not you know, just the string of communication. And, um, you know, of course, as the quarterback on the field, we were, the flag is getting thrown on delay a game or illegal substitution. And, um, you know, all eyes go to me to rectify it. So, you know, that's just in the heat of the game. And, uh, you know, I, I sure I was frustrated and, and showed my frustration. I don't know things happen. <laughs> my, I apologize. My question was not to point out that you got frustrated, although it did elicit the entertaining answer I think I was looking for. <laughs> but the question was more a foundational question to how was it different for you? Lou Holtz, I love him to this day. He's written me a couple of notes over the years. We all love Lou, but he was not easy to play for. Uh, either in practice, he backed off in games, tried to make practices the most difficult thing you would go through, so games would be easier. But was it, how was it different for you when he was upstairs than on the sideline? Did it make it, I guess that I'm not going to say easier, certainly not better, because you, you already talked about the difficulty of getting those plays in, but how was it different with him up there as opposed to being right there in the sideline? Uh, it was all, it all revolved around communication, you know, and, and, and when, um, you know, I think coach probably, and I don't know this for sure, but he probably communicated with his coaches about the same as he did on the sideline or in the booth. Um, but his ability to get to a player or answer a, a specific question for a player or direct a player, oftentimes being me, the quarterback, of course, um, that's where the challenge came in. So, um, you know, I don't think it was one way or the other incredibly um, altering of the, the actual game itself. Um, you know, he was still calling the plays the way he would with a little more creativity, as he noted, and we've all noted. Uh, but the communication might, a little, might have been a little more challenging from Coach Holtz directly to the players is, is probably the biggest difference. that we. So bottom line was it was better to have him on the sidelines than in the booth. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so let's get into the let's get into the game here. When I went back and watched, um, you know, you mentioned it, fifty six running attempts. So USC went three and out in their first drive. I saw you guys get the ball back. Autry Denson jumped off the page. Mark Edwards jumped off the page. You gave them the ball a ton. Um, what I was struck by, especially on that first drive, and they pointed it out quickly, Ron, is you guys ran and maybe once or twice you ran the option, and they were asking why were they keying on Paulus, Denson's the guy that's going to beat him with the pitch. Uh, did you sense that they were kind of over committing to you? Because you guys had success with the option a few times and it led to, you know, some big plays in that first half. Yeah, I mean, I had 21 yards gained in the, in the, in the game. I mean, come on, I'm, I'm a threat. <laughs> I'm selling you short, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Listen, you, you, here's the thing. Here's the option to the near side and the pit. And again, it is Audrey Denson down the sideline. They're going to mark him out around the 24-yard line. Now watch on this option. We talked about the fact that Paulus is either going to get smacked or he's going to pitch it. Look at him draw the defenders to him. The defenders are drawn to Paulus. I don't know why. He's not a running threat. The only thing that is a threat that when he starts running is a threat that he might get hurt. Here, it's hard to – the discipline it takes to say – that guy has the ball, and I'm not going to go to the ball. That, that's right. hard to do. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to break 50, 60-yard runs, um, but I could go pick up four, five, six, seven yards, which I did in that game. And so, therefore, you can't, you can't completely disregard the ball. I mean, here comes a guy with the ball, and you come at him. And my goal and perspective running the option was to, you know, get him to – attack me let them come to me so I can pitch the ball and, and get it to our, our runners who are who are designated to run with the ball and and um, so yeah we wanted to use the option um, it's what coach Holtz knew it's what he knew to get him into and situations he wanted to get into to get him out of situations he wanted to get out of he knew and knew how to game plan and run the option and so we needed to run it that that, that was part of what made our offense more um, more effective in that game. So while I'm not looking to uh, break all kinds of runs around the field as, as you know, Tony Rice did or some, some guys in the past, 
uh, it can still be an effective part of the offense to uh, threaten the defense of the guy that has the ball. You, you know, the hey. first the first touchdown from Edwards there was a nine yard <laughs> uh, yeah. run where he ran over two different guys. I mean, what was it like playing with that guy? And I mean, if you go back and watch probably any of the touchdown runs in this game, but specifically the first one. I mean, he just bulldozed two guys in the same way that Keyshawn stuck out for USC as like a man amongst boys. That's what Mark Edwards looked like to me. First down and goal to go. Here's Edwards. Helmet to helmet. Touchdown, Notre Dame. Whoa, nine yards of just physical effort. One, two, Mark Edwards, and he got the touchdown. Yeah, Mark was uh, – it was – Awesome to play with. I mean, Mark, Mark was a guy um, who knew what he was doing. He was really reliable and dependable um, and, and tough, as I mentioned before, just a, a group of tough guys. And Mark really led the way on that. He was more versatile than, than a lot of fullbacks, you know, in that area were given credit for. As a big guy, he could be a banger and a bruiser up inside. He could catch a toss and go outside. He could catch passes. He caught screens um, and a phenomenal blocker. But, you know, Mark was a – Mark, you know, there's a reason he was in the NFL for 10 years too. I mean, he's a really good football player. He's sharp. He's dependable. And he is tough. I mean, he – if you go into a foxhole, Mark Edwards is the kind of guy you want, you want with you. And, Tony, you pointed out earlier how the game looked different. So much eye formation in this yeah. game. I've often joked with Mark, who will tell you what a key cog he was in this win and virtually every win you guys had. I love Mark and his confident personality. He was the last true fullback that Notre Dame has had. The game has changed. And I know a lot of the old school fans go, we need to go back to that kind of football. Well, nobody plays that kind of football anymore. But you had the ball almost 10 and a half minutes more than USC in this game. And you were a throwing quarterback. That first drive, though, you made three key passes, two on third down, and then the one that set up uh, that touchdown uh, was uh, late in that drive. I think it was to Derek Mays down to the nine-yard line, and then you gave it to Mark. What was it like for you as a passing quarterback, so to speak, to play in an offense that depended so heavily on the run? Um, it felt very normal. You know, I mean, it was – it was. Um, you know, football was a really balanced game in, in, in back in, in, in those days. I mean, in that game, we, we were a little heavier on the run. We were always a little heavier on the run, but you were always looking for yardage to be uh, really balanced in those days. And, you know, I came from a high school program where, you know, I threw the ball, you know, I don't know, 25, 30, 20, 35 times a game. I mean, it wasn't like I was throwing the ball 60, 70 times a game. So to come to Notre Dame and throw it 24 times one game and 28 times another game and 32 times another game and 14 times another game, um, you know, that just felt like what football should be. That's That was a, a, a huge um, indicator of what the game was in our world at that time. Um, again, some teams spread it out and threw it all over the place, but the good teams were the teams that were balanced. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, it felt, it felt um, like it should feel uh, to be part of a, a balanced offense. And I should probably put this perspective in your, you ended your career leading Notre Dame all time in touchdown passes with 52. Uh, you're now fifth. Ian Book just passed you last season. Uh, a guy named Brady Quinn crushed you with 95, but that's more a reflection of how the game had changed. That's why I wanted to get your sense. So what you were doing really wasn't that unusual in the context of the way football was played. If you threw the, the ball in your era 40, 45, 50 times, the game probably wasn't going well for your team. Yeah, absolutely. It was a different, it was a different game, you, you, you know, and, and it had also created a much smaller margin for error too, which is why you threw, you know, you, you threw the ball in yeah. third and seven, third and five, third and nine. I mean, that's where all your throws came from and which made it a, a, a more of a challenge as to, you know, you throw it on first, second down a little bit more, you, you you, you mix in some incompletions, some bigger plays, some, uh, and, you, and you get some things going. You alleviate a lot of pressure off of the offense, uh, which is what today's offense looks more like. But, yeah, guys, you know, we throw the ball more, more these days. I, I've been thrilled to, to have been at Notre Dame and, and watch Brady Quinn pass me and watch Jimmy Clausen pass me and watch Ian Book pass me. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm rooting for those guys. Work with Tommy Reese, who I'm sure has passed me as well. So we – 
Edwards got in and it was 6 nothing. You guys missed the extra point. I thought the next drive, and it's where that signature play you talked about, the big hit uh, from Tatum came through. But there was a play before then. I thought Keyshawn, I mean, he had six yards for – or six catches for 122 in this game. Uh, the quarterback, Brad Otten, missed him on a pass. I think he could have gone a long ways on. They threw one behind him. He slipped. It kind of spoke to maybe you were talking about West Coast team coming out to the kind of dreary – whether he lost. Notre Dame is up 6 nothing. play action. Fake, good protection. All the time in the world, but behind. A sliding reception by Keyshawn Johnson. He has it at the 29-yard line. It's good for 17. But Auden is off target. If he had hit him in stride, he could have had another 10 or 15 yards. Well, watch the concentration as Johnson takes about a five-yard divot. <laughs> lost his footing. Uh, but the hit from Tatum, on the goal line. I mean, the, the defense was huge in this game for you guys. I think they had three or four stops inside the red zone. And coming into this game, they put it on the screen. NBC did a great job. They were 16. They scored 16 touchdowns in their 23 red zone trips coming in. So they're converting it, you know, like a 70% rate. And the defense came up. So on the whole, you can speak to the defense. But when Tatum made that hit, what did that do for your team on the sideline? Because it's an iconic play in Notre Dame history. Second and goal, 40 yard line. Washington hit fumble. The ball is loose. Notre Dame says they have it. And they do. Yeah, I, you know, I, I get, we get talking about offense. I was the quarterback. Obviously, there's so much focus on offense, but. We had an excellent defense. I mean, talk about a salty group of guys that could play, uh, you know, from the guys up front, that linebacker core, the secondary. I, I mean, I'm not going to get into the name and names, but I mean, those guys were, because I don't want to leave one of those greats out, but I mean, those guys were a great group of players on that defense. Guys that, um, you know, that, that was uh, another illustration of just playing tough guy football. Um, but when it came to the, the hit you're talking about, the play you're talking about with Ken and Tatum, you know, it, it kind of illustrates the willingness to sell out on a play. I mean, he was getting cut blocked. He dove over it as he's, as he's defending the block and put, his hands are down and behind him. He's flying through the air um, head first with complete reckless abandon uh, to get to the ball. And, you know, it was that, it was that kind of willingness um, that I think sparked the defense, sparked the entire game uh, to his willingness to, to, to go all out like that, pop the ball out, created the turnover. Uh, we got it, we recovered it. And, 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 you know, that was kind of the turning point in the game, probably, uh, even though it was really early on in the game, it was probably when it, when it really turned, but um, yeah, an iconic play. That's a, that's a, that's an award winner today, probably. And when you talk about their toughness, obviously athletes have changed. The players are so much bigger today. But even by the standards of the mid-90s, it struck me again, I had forgotten really how small the Notre Dame defense was in stature, especially along the defensive line. That matchup between the Notre Dame defensive line and a USC offensive line, which for those days was huge, they averaged just under 300 pounds per man. And just how a smaller Notre Dame defense physically dominated that game, I think was remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't necessarily take note of our size because I, I, I see it as the, the toughness, the scrappiness, the quickness, the, the, the tenacity that our defense showed. And, you know, that's what I recall of that defense and, and you know, all those guys all, all across the board. The, the thing I found interesting, because everyone I've talked to is that they, they refer to the Tatum hit and you just did yourself as the turning point in the game but it didn't lead to an immediate score. In fact, USC actually came down and took a, a brief 7-6 lead where Keyshawn made a great catch and tiptoed the sideline. The, the stretch of the game that I think would be really interesting to break down here is the final four minutes of the second quarter because you guys were down 7-6. to six. You know, it's kind of been, I'd say both teams, I, I felt like you guys had been playing better than USC up to that point, but just didn't have the points to show for it. Uh, when you think back to whether it's being in the huddle or driving late uh, in this, in this, in the second quarter to get back in front, what was the mindset? Was anybody frustrated? Were you trying to just keep everyone, you know, stick to the plan because it felt like you guys were having success and the points will come. What was the mindset? Yeah, I think, um, I think 
there, there wasn't frustration at all. I, I think everybody was just uh, playing the game. Um, you know, I don't know how many drives we had because we had such long drives. Uh, I don't know how many drives we had leading up to that point. So I don't know that we, we necessarily came up empty too often or anything like that. But, um, you know, we were – we were feeling confident, you know, we were feeling confident and, and, uh, you know, the, the, the turning point back to Ken and Tatum and that hit. And the reason I think we all think about it as the turning point is they were on the move. They were going down to the end zone. They were in front of the goal line. And it was, it was, it was as if they were, they were starting to turn the tide and they were starting to push the, and, and push it over the hill. And, you know, telling us, here we come, here we come. And it was a little bit, our response was a little bit of that, you know, oh, you want it? Okay, you got it. And now, and now Ken and Tatum makes that hit and it flips it. So even on offense, we're, we're still feeling that going into, you know, the, the later part of the second quarter, we're still feeling that momentum of, of, of owning the, the surge that this game has taken over right now, that our defense helped us get. The offense had a long sustained drive. Defense has, has turned the ball back over for us. So, you know, it, it was we, – we felt really good and still very confident on offense. And I think that's interesting, Ron, because, again, the Tatum – that's the Tatum plays the signature play of the game. But you don't score when you get the ball back after that play. And then they do score. So that play had that kind of a, a lasting impact. And I wonder, after they scored and took the lead on that next drive, that's when your running prowess jumped out. First, the scramble, where you got nailed out of bounds, which would be flagged today, but not then. <laughs> oh, then it was get tough and today. get out. <laughs> yeah, 30-yard penalty today. <laughs> and then you ran the option, and you kept it for a big game. And everybody talked about the story that you had gone to Coach Holtz and said, look, I want to run the option more. But to run it, you have to keep it on occasion. Why did you go and, and plead with Lou to run it more? Well, you know, I, I had no issue running the option. You know, I, I, I ran the ball in high school. I didn't mind running the football. I mean, it was just part of playing quarterback. Um, and I felt like um, I just wanted coach to know that. Like, please don't think I don't want to run it or don't think that I, I, I can't run it. You know, if we're looking for some yardage, we want to put a defensive in a bind. Um, let's let's run the option. And and so that was all it was. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily begging coach to run the option because I, I, I want to show off my running prowess. It was because we needed it for the play calling of Coach Holtz and our offensive staff to set things up the way they needed to set it up. And I wanted him to know I'm ready. I'll run it. Let's put it in. Let's do it. We did it against one of the best defenses in the country on, on that stage right there um, with a lot of success. So, you know, I think I was an easy, it was easy to say we shouldn't run it or whatever, because I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't one of the faster guys on our team or whatever, but th that that's, that's really an ill-conceived thought when, uh, you know, you see the success we had doing it on, on, a, on, on that stage against a, a really good opponent. So that, that's, that's really where it came from. Just wanting coach to feel comfortable in calling it, and, and I felt comfortable running it. Let's go. So you guys drove down the field. Mark Edwards bulldozed his way in for another touchdown. And then my favorite play watching this whole game back is the two-point conversion that you yeah. caught in the end yeah. zone. Anybody that's listening to this or watching this should pause right now and go watch <laughs> it because – that can't be exactly how it was drawn up, but I need you to talk me through that play because it was awesome. So the big back offense, it is Edwards. He's going to throw. He's going to, he wanted to throw back to Pollock. Now he scampered. He's still going. Now he throws into the end zone. Touchdown or the not conversion is gone. Oh, my. Um, the way it looked in the game is really not, not how you draw it up. Um, but, you know, it all starts with we score – and I look to the sideline and I see that we're going to go for two. Um, I go over to the sideline and I know that this play call is coming. So as this play call is coming in, you know, we're keeping two fullbacks in the game. I believe it was Marcus Thorne was probably the other fullback in the game. And, but Mark, need, Mark Edwards needs to go to, to tailback. So as I'm coming into the huddle, I'm telling Mark, hey, get your, take your glove off or get rid of your throwing this or, you know, <laughs> you know to get Mark's mind uh, adjusted from, from bruising his way into the end zone to now he's moving to a, a, a passer. 
Um, so we call the play, and, and I, I wish I wish I could share with you the play call. I, I can't remember exactly what, what the play call was. Toss 38 something, throwback, QB throwback, I suppose. Um, and, you know, the, like I said, the idea is to toss it to, to Mark, roll and right. He's going to take a few steps, show the run to the right plant, and just throw it across the field to me. Uh, as the quarterback, you toss it and you try to kind of ease out of the pocket. You don't want to, you don't want to scramble out of there too fast um, and show the defense that you're you're going out for a pass. But uh, they were on to us both pretty quickly. You know, Mark pulled up to throw, got some pressure. Uh, the defensive end saw him pull up and turned and started running at me. Um, and Mark scrambled left on his own. And and uh, you know, I, I can remember my my thought process I was standing in the back of the end zone and, and I watched this play in preparation for talking today and you know I'm, I'm waving my hands telling them and I can remember saying throw it and in my head thinking this is what an open receiver looks like Mark throw it. you gotta <laughs> you gotta throw this <laughs> I'm wide open here and um, you know God bless Mark I mean he got us he got himself in a position to just kind of shot put it up and over the the defender and and uh, turned into a pretty easy catch but uh uh, Mark was a. Uh, it was you know the D, the the, the O line holding up for that long, and then uh, Mark finding a way to get the ball out was uh, made the play special. You you also were very uh, nonchalant and casual with that toss back to the official. You <laughs> acted like you'd been there before. I, I liked it. Um, <laughs> the uh, I thought then you know there were about two minutes left, and I'm thinking watching this back, uh, how are they going to get another seven points out of this before halftime? And USC went down, and they were driving. And you mentioned the the, the defense, how well they played. Allen Rossum made a huge uh, play on third down to break it up. A game, you just can't do that. It'd be a big win. Third down and set. A scramble for it. It is incomplete. Keyshawn Johnson, the intended receiver, and there was great coverage by Notre Dame. Well, remember we talked about earlier about the job that had to be done one-on-one -on -one and back with a zone. Rossum. That is one-on-one -on -one case of right there, Rossum taking on Johnson. I know, Jack, we were talking before this. Then they go yeah. for it on fourth down, which I, I don't know about you. It seemed a little bit perplexing to go for it on fourth down. But you guys got the ball back, and it gave you one more chance to drive and grab points before halftime. I thought that defensive stand, and maybe, Jack, you can speak to this a little bit because you were talking about it earlier, just oh. that that – really allowed Notre Dame to find a way to grab points at the end of the half they probably shouldn't have had. Well, you talk about going for it on fourth down. It was fourth and six, close to midfield. Notre Dame's team, and they're going for it on fourth down with two minutes to go. He'll scramble for it and will come up short. About a yard and a half shot. Wahos looked deep. The coverage was there for Notre Dame. He tried to pick it up. He does not make it. The Irish take over on now. Bert Berry with the tackle. I mean, it yeah. was almost like a challenge to the Notre Dame defense. And, and Ron, you're watching this, I would assume. You're not on the field. But I almost got the sense the defense said, are you kidding me? You're going on us on fourth and sixth. This is not going to happen. Yeah, I think we were, you know, looking back and knowing, you know, things I know now, I, I would – you look back and you realize USC was probably really frustrated. Right, they were they were frustrated with what was going on. They weren't moving, or they were moving the ball. They weren't scoring points. They had turnovers. You know, it just wasn't going. And so they were probably looking for a spark just as well. And and um, you know, so for them to go for it, I think it was a little bit of uh, yeah, rolling the dice, figuring that there's not much time left in the half. So Notre Dame probably will sit on it or just won't won't try to score if. Uh, if we don't get the ball, if we don't get the first down, but also I think it was them, their frustration showing through um, that they weren't getting done what they wanted to get done on offense. So when you took over, you guys had a quick, great drive. You found Emmett Mosley for a big catch along the sideline. And there was a play, you know, along the goal line where you were hit. I think it was a, somebody from the weak side came and they got to you and it was almost intercepted right by the goal line. It's just good, clean football. And a lot of respect. Ball is pumped back. Just as he released the ball, he was really hammered. Almost cost him an interception. Wow. Whoa. Marcus Bonds. Marcus Bonds puts a scrambler. 007. It just fell short. And on the next play, Autry Denson ran it in for a touchdown to get that two score lead. I mean, it's the, the, it is amazing going back when you watch these classic games. Like the margin is so 
thin. It could have easily been a pick and going the other way. And instead, yeah. Autry's in for a touchdown. You guys are up two scores. Yeah, we drove down the field. We threw a couple passes and, and got the ball down the field, used a few timeouts. Uh, and, yeah, I, I, I recall the play. It was, I was looking one way and, and went to throw it the other way and got whacked. Um, and the ball just, you know, I wanted it to go there and it went there <laughs> as I was getting hit, you know, that's, that's life in the pocket sometimes. And, um, yeah, we were fortunate that, that it wasn't intercepted. Um, but it put us in a position to, uh, to get the ball to Autry and, you know, our O line created a huge hole and, and, you know, you get Autry one-on-one -on -one with a defender on the goal line. I mean, he's scoring every time. So. Here is the game to Autry Denson. Touchdown North Yeah, that was uh, that was a huge stop by the defense, um, accepting that challenge and coming up with a huge stop and turning it into points was really had to be really devastating for USC at that time. Tony, I love that answer because that's the Ron Paulus that I remember. <laughs> Confident, a leader of the team. He said, yeah, we threw a couple of passes. Well, actually, folks, in just over a minute, you completed four passes. That was the most pass-heavy drive of the game. You had to get down the field. The 26-yard pass to Mosley was great the biggest great gain throw. of the game to that point, the biggest gain for Notre Dame. You finished the half. You talked about not much of a margin for error. And as much as we've talked about the rushing attack in this game, which was so critical, you finished the half 13-17 to 17 for 141 yards. So the passing game was fairly critical, and it's not like you got a lot of do-overs. When you threw the ball, you had to be successful. And you were. So it was more than just a couple passes that led to that third touchdown. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and 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 I, I know that. I mean, you know, I, we did rely on the pass a little bit more and, you know, uh, in the first half there. And, and, I, and I, that is what kept, you know, I think that also kept USC off balance to, to have to deal with the pass game uh, as well as the run game. And, you know, as Coach Holtz used to say often during the game, you know, I don't like to throw the ball because two or th the three things yeah. can happen and two of them are bad. Either an interception <laughs> or an incompletion are bad. So make sure I'm calling the next offensive play and not the next defense. You know, it's a, it's a heck, of, heck of good advice as you're going out onto the field wow. to, to go down the field. But, um, you know, that was just the world we were in. And, uh, yeah, so I, I think throwing the ball, especially in that first half, kept us uh, – kept the defense – or kept uh, USC off balance enough to make us both effective in the run and the pass. Ron, I don't know if this will make you feel any more that uh, Holt, Lou Holtz shared his intensity with members of the media as well, but it was before you got there. Rick Meyer was the quarterback, and we had just conducted an interview. And at that time, Lou would give every TV station a one-on-one -on -one interview one day a week. And we were talking about the passing game and the struggles and maybe you should pass more. And he walked away and we turned the camera off. He turned around and came back to me saying just what you just said with extreme intensity. <laughs> and my Lou impersonation is not great, but I, I won't do other than he just basically goes, yeah, I don't like throwing the football. Because if you throw <laughs> the football, three things can happen and two of them are bad. And then he turned <laughs> around and walked, and walked back to the Loftus Center. So I, I know yeah. that he felt throwing the ball was a gamble. So the, the, obviously the, the confidence that he put in you, but, but what I liked was, and this is where I want to get, we're in a me era and you're now associate athletic director for football, but you came from an era where you didn't go look at me. I know Lou always don't take your helmet off, act like you've been there before, but the culture was different. People kind of really prided themselves on when you had success, act like a that you expected to have it, that you're not surprised, and B, never forget that football, which I think is the ultimate team game, is a team game. Um, do you win sometimes when you watch the game as a whole today and how so many people wanted to be focused on individuals when you know from the way you play, and uh, anybody I think who understands football knows there is no play, r rarely is there the play in football that one guy has been able to do by himself. Yeah, football is the ultimate team sport. Uh, you know, you can have 10 guys doing exactly the right thing. And if one guy screws it up, you got a problem. So, and the play is not successful. Um, yeah, it's a different era. There's a different focus on, on uh, there's difference in, in what the focus is on, whether it's, you know, the, the team and the unit and downplaying self or, you know, in another instances, there's, there's um, some, some, 
you know, attention seeking. Um, but I'm, I'm not that old. Okay. You know, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the grumpy old man yet. <laughs> you know, it's a different world. It's a different game. We have different focuses. You know, I think the world today needs, needs more, um, you know, justification for things they're doing, why they're doing it, how well, they're doing recognition. it. Recognition. You need recognition and you have to change because yeah. that's the culture. That's right. And, and we just, that wasn't, the culture is different. The culture was different now than it was then. And, uh, but I don't, I don't begrudge today's world, uh, any differently. I've, I have two kids I'm raising and, um, you know, we need to, we need to keep them as selfless as possible, but, uh, but understanding that they need recognition differently. The world is, the world is different today. Culture is different today than it was. And, um, I'm not going to change it, uh, but I don't mind recalling the past. And, you know, when the team was, uh, was the number one, was the number one goal. So, it might be the USC blood from my parents, but when I'm watching this and I'm looking at the box score and how it all played out, I think if I'm a USC fan watching this game, I'm kicking myself. Cause like you said, they go for it on fourth and six. Then you had that drive. Then I'm looking here and they still had time to drive down before the end of the half. They threw two fades to Keyshawn that were one was broken up. Great defensive play in the back of the end zone. And then uh, one was thrown into the band section. Then there's that tip ball that's caught and time runs out. So they kind of shot themselves in the foot at the goal line. Again, the defense does an amazing job again on the goal line and you guys go into halftime 21 seven with, with all of the momentum. Is there anything from the locker room, Ron, that you remember from that halftime specifically? It's Third down and goal. Blitzing pressure. It is tipped and then caught. defense when they really needed it they put themselves in a hole and they kept them out not only did we grab the momentum with that touchdown by Autry but to go back down to have the defense go back down the field and stop them again inside the five was um, was an incredible momentum builder for us you know our our being up 21-7 at halftime um, felt right to us, you know, being in the locker room at halftime, it felt right. You know, all those times you talk about before a game, nobody's going to come into our house and, and, and take our home field. And, you know, those are the kind of things we talked about before the game against a really good team. And, um, and they were coming to fruition at halftime. So yeah, halftime was very serious. We were always very serious. Uh, we were very, it was very instructional with the coaches, um, but it felt very right in our world. Uh, and, 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 and we were really excited to get back out on the field for the second half. You know, when you came out on the field the second half, do you know what you did on the first pass of the second half? Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's I mean, you, Tony, sound, you sound like Tony everybody else. Tony Simeone. So, I mean, Tony <laughs> Simeone. Give me a break, Tony. Uh, I'm just giving but, you a hard time. I, I think it's funny that it came out, there's a pick, and again, the defense held them to three. I mean, I think yeah. that the, the more I watch this game and think about it, talking to you, the defense really came up in the big spots they needed to. And it might not have been the oh. takeaway for six, right? It was holding them to three in that spot. It was little things like that throughout the whole day. Well, and Tony, all it's day, a question that had to be won. asked. But, yeah. I, but I want to – the whole context of this is you know, the coaching staff wanted to go for the kill right there. Derek Mays had been frustrated. They were all over him. So you went deep to Derek into, what, a 30, 40-mile-an-hour win? And the pass just hung up there. So it wasn't like you threw a total – egg up there you tried to execute the play and it just didn't work but it didn't look like i know you weren't happy thanks jack, thanks, jack. that's <laughs> right. right you're damn right that's yeah. right yeah it was wind it was the yeah, wind no i'm yeah. not getting on because bad, bad listen, play call there. bad conditions <laughs> great quarterback yeah. i got it i got yeah, it yeah yeah no well, you're, you're exactly right but no that that was the idea sure you come out in the second half and you yeah. go for you know you take a shot and make a big play whether it's a touchdown or not i mean that's a huge dagger to them so yes it left the door open for another couple minutes but yeah our, our you, you know you you hit on it tony our our defense was really incredible. And, and again, you're talking to an offensive guy and the quarterback, so we have a lot of offensive slant to this. But, you know, those guys in, on defense and, and Kenan Tatum and Burt Berry and LaRon Cobbins and, you know, Brian McGee and, I, I, you know, all those guys there, I, I broke the rule. I, I started naming people, and so I'm surely going to – trouble now, them. yeah. You know, those guys were – they were incredible on, on that defensive uh, – on the defense all day to, to – not only bail us out after a turnover and only give up three, but um, the stops inside the inside the five yard line inside in the red zone. 
against a really good team. <laughs> you know, Number this five. wasn't, yeah. yeah, this wasn't just an opponent who was getting into the red zone. This was the undefeated fifth ranked team in the country that people, they were on their way to the national championship game. Um, so yeah, the defense, I, I can't say enough about the defense. They did a great job. And the next scoring play was a safety. I mean, they, they gave mm-hmm. USC fits. I mean, they, they Corey got the Minor, points. that's right. Yep, yep, exactly. Yep. Minor got the safety. There wasn't a lot of scoring. In fact, there was only the three points from USC in the third quarter. Your only passing touchdown came in the fourth quarter. Do you remember it? I do. I do, yeah. Third and goal from the two. And he wants to throw. It is there. It is high. A one-hand grab. Uh, you know, you run the ball 56 times, you figure you can get one good play action pass off of it, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we ran the ball to Mark up in the middle so often. I We were down inside the five, I don't know, three or four yard line or whatever it was. And, and um, you know, it was, it, was, it was based off of a lot of the inside runs that we had been running uh, to Mark, um, some of the interior traps. Um, so we just came back and, and stepped back, and it's a, it was a one-step fake to Mark and Pete Kriplevich, uh, tight end, sold the block and, and slipped into the back of the end zone. Um, you know, a really basic play-action pass. But like I said, when you're running the ball and dominating a defense on the ground the way we were, uh, especially a defense that's not accustomed to it, you know, you pull out a little pop pass like that, and, uh, and, it, and it had great success. But, you know, we packed it in. We had, you know, our whole offense – at the line of scrimmage, I think maybe we had one wide receiver wide left. Um, so they had 10 guys in the box. We have, you know, 10 guys in the box and, um, and they fully committed to the run and, and, and pretty easy pop pass to, to Pete Kriplevich who made a nice catch and um, it was a nice play. But it was a seven play drive and that was the only pass. You had run it six consecutive times. Can you see as a quarterback, can you sense when they're biting on and I assume that was a call play. And I also, how, at that yeah. point, how much ability did you have to check off? Did you have much ability to change the play at the line of scrimmage? Uh, yeah, on a few occasions. Yeah, and under certain circumstances, you know, and, and um, you know, nothing like going to the line of scrimmage, scanning the whole thing and, and changing a play. But in certain formations and certain personnel groups, if I felt there was a fade there or a slant there, um, I know a few weeks earlier, when we played Texas, you know, Derek and I, we were running, running, running down the field and Derek looked at me and I looked at him and I audibled the play and threw him a fade for a touchdown. You know, um, you know, those kind of things happen at different times, but uh, not in a scenario like that. That was a called play, you know, but as a quarterback, sure, you can, you can see the defense creeping up and all the downhill slant. And even in the few minutes of this game recap that I watched, I could see their linebackers walking up to the line of scrimmage, trying to call out where the run was going to be. Um, so you, you know that play action is ready to go, and that's part of that communication you have with the sideline. So the Kraplevich touchdown made it 31-10. You guys added one more. Mark Edwards again bulldozed his way in. It was 38-10. That was, that was the final. I mean, as the game was, was winding down, Ron, and you guys sensed finally that you'd done it, I want to know what was going through your head and what it was like to be on the sideline because, as we have talked about at the beginning of this, this was – kind of a, I mean, it was a a monumental win for you personally. I know you spoke about that afterwards and, and for the team at that point in the season, it was big. Jack talked about how this was kind of a, an inflection point in the season and to beat the number five team in the country by 28 points, hold them to 10 at home national TV. I mean, what, what was going through your head on the sideline? What was the, what was the emotion like? Yeah, it, it was exciting. You know, it was exciting. We we were, um, you know, we we knew that we were just part of a of a of a really marquee game. Um, it wasn't a national championship game. It wasn't going to be a national championship season. It wasn't one versus two in the eleventh game of the year. You know, but in the scheme of our recent memory and where we were as a team, this was a really marquee game to, to have, again, to have USC undefeated, ranked fifth in the country, coming into Notre Dame and in, in the environment we, we were presenting um, at, at the point we were at with a couple losses on the season. I mean, this was a big, big game for us. And so it was exciting. Everybody was excited. We were happy. We were, um, we were, we were hugging each other and running around thrilled. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was notable to me as I watched the, the last couple minutes of the game, um, 
fans on the field, people were everywhere. I was walking off hugging guys. I don't, you know, um, so that was, it, it was fun. It was a really family atmosphere and, and on the field and, and um, you know, a lot of great, uh, a lot of great uh, work by, by, by our football team that day. You know, Jack, I want to know from your standpoint, what did this win mean at the time for Notre Dame? You were covering the team. I mean, what did it mean to get that win the way they did over USC? Well, I think it sent a message to everybody that they had turned it back around. I mean, the previous year had been very disappointing. There was a bowl alliance game on the line, a major bowl bid on the line that folks knew if Notre Dame hadn't won this game, they wouldn't go to a major bowl. This pretty much locked in that they would. And I mean, Ron, highly talented quarterback. This was his team. He's got two years left after this. It was a step everybody wanted to see Notre Dame make, and they made it. And it was critical. Plus, it was USC. So, Ron, I want to ask you this, and, and please correct me, but I still think this is the one game everybody in Notre Dame wants to win more than anything else. Now, over the years, and you were part of that stretch where you played Michigan every year, there might be a sliver of respect 10, 15 years down the road for some USC guys when you run into them. Tell me if that's not true. I think there's more just outright dislike for Michigan. But USC is still – the rivalry. So to, to have a USC team come to Notre Dame with national championship aspirations and take that away from them had to feel pretty good. Absolutely felt pretty good. It was, it was, uh, yeah, there are, you could name a lot of different rivalries that we have, but the, the USC game and the USC rivalry has lasted longer than any of those games you know we've been on and off with Michigan and on and off with Michigan State and you know some of some of those other games at Penn State was a huge rival there for yeah, several wow. years um Florida State for several years you know but 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 USC has always been there um you know I, I my comparison of the the Notre Dame USC rivalry versus the Notre Dame Michigan rivalry is the Michigan rivalry exists because there's a lot of similarities, right? We're both in the Midwest. We both play a certain style of football historically. Um, the top programs in number of wins and winning percentage and history and and um, but it, it's because of the similarities that the rivalry I think exists. The USC rivalry exists because of the differences. And you know they're from the West Coast and we're Midwest and they're sunshine and we're gray skies and you know they're they're throwing a ball all over and we're banging banging it away on the ground and um, their recruiting base is the West Coast and our recruiting base is Midwest and, and East for the most part back in those days. Um, so that was a, that, that, that's how I see those rivalries. Um, but but the USC rivalry to take that team and and to to knock them off the way we did that was a huge. A uh, huge victory for us, and it, and it was really, really satisfying, both for what it did for our program, um, but what it and and what it did for uh, to the USC program at the time as a rival, but also what it did for the fans and and the excitement around the program. I mean, it was it was an important win for us that, at that time. It was one of the best games of that time. Again, Notre Dame, you guys went on to win every game on the rest of your schedule in the regular season played a very good Florida State team in the Orange Bowl, and then USC went to the Rose Bowl to play that Northwestern team that you guys lost to at the beginning of the year. So two teams that played in two pretty remarkable bowl games at the end of the season. Uh, Jack and Ron, that is our first episode of Run It Back. I want to thank you guys for doing it. I had a blast listening to the two of you guys reminisce about that game from 25 years ago. Well, it was my pleasure. I tell you, I had a blast reliving it. I can't believe it was 25 years ago, and – you know, talking to the guys that played in that game with me, I, you know, it was uh, Mark Edwards and, and Rick Kaczynski and Chris Clevenger and Mike Dowdy and those guys that were banging away on that offensive line. I mean, those guys um, really paved the way and, and, and made it a special game. And uh, to look back and reminisce with you guys and reminisce with my friends in the last few days, knowing we were going to do this has been, has been a lot of fun. So thanks. I appreciate it. No, and I, I had a blast too. And, you know, when people ask me, I just finished my 38th year covering Notre Dame athletics. Why am I still here? It's guys like Ron establishing a relationship when he was a player. I, I now consider him a friend. Still helps me out on those uh, road trips with the team now for my radio duties. But, I mean, when, when you talk about a 40-year decision, uh, he's an embodiment of the 40-year decision. Was able to go out to the financial world, but loved football so much. And now he's back 
and helping his alma mater and doing such a fine job. And I just had a blast doing this. And I had a blast. I don't watch a lot of old games from start to finish. I may have to start doing that again. I know. Was it was fun. That was really fun. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Tony. So I'm with Lou Holtz now. All right. Come on. Come on. Thank you. Um, Coach, what does a win like this mean to this team on this day? Well, I think we've come back from uh, adversity, but this was a great win. I'm happy for our seniors. I'm happy for our football team. We, uh, you know, we fought hard all year. We've lost two close ones, but I'm real proud of our team. We beat a very good Southern Cal team. You know, I've been with the Irish a lot of years. I don't think I've seen more creative offense from you. I, uh, we did some different things, but I want to tell you, when you're up there, you're a lot more gambling, more wide open than you can see, but we just felt we had to do it to keep them off balance. Great job. They all did our defense, uh, and we ran a little bit more option than we have, and we just thank God to, to win the game. We're happy for our fans. Congratulations to you, Coach. Thank you very much.